Hello, everyone. I am Stefan Vassalanka. I'm uh, the deputy head of the OECD Center for Educational Research and Innovation and a senior analyst um, working at the Directorate for Education and Skills at the OECD. So it is really my pleasure to, to welcome you to this uh, first session of a two-day event that we have on fostering 21st century skills in higher education. Uh, and more specifically, where we will focus on how governments and institutions can actually support the development of uh, student skills. This is a two-day event, so that's the first session, and we will have two other ones, one later on today, another one tomorrow, which is part of a summer project called Teaching, Learning, and Assessing Creativity and Critical Thinking in Higher Education, and which really looks at uh, how we can actually support the shift towards competency-based curricula in schools, but also in higher education. You know? So the idea is really how do we manage to develop student skills at the same time as we develop the knowledge, both the procedural and the content knowledge in different subjects. So all this work is related to, um, in fact, the demand of uh, the labor market, you know, the fact that uh, in OECD countries, but in fact, in many countries in the world, there is now a strong demand for innovation skills, for entrepreneurial skills, and this is, has become really one of the objectives of higher education. Uh, the digitalization of our societies also make it more and more important you know, to develop these skills that are more difficult to replicate uh, by computers, such as creativity, critical thinking, but communication, etc. And so this is one of the big challenges uh, ahead from uh, uh, higher education institutions. Second aspect of it is really that all this work that we're doing is about uh, improving the quality of teaching and learning. There was a lot of debate in higher education about uh, how uh, the quality of research can be improved, but we have to keep in mind that one of you know, the key mission of higher education is actually to teach students, to equip them with the skill that they need for lifelong learning for their life and to have a, a, you know, good jobs and, and a happy life. And this is really something that we believe is possible through this shift towards competency-based uh, uh, curricula. So we do some work with actually 26 higher education institutions from 14 countries on trying to exemplify how this can be done in practice, how this can be made tangible. And so what we're working on is really making clear what this looks like. So how can we make it tangible? How can we, can we make it visible? You know, what teaching the skills and equipping students with those skills, giving them the opportunity to develop them looks like. What, what are the kind of courses? What is the kind of support that should be given to uh, uh, higher education faculty members to do that? Uh, and so that's really one of the big questions that we have through uh, our our project. The second one, which actually we're going to address really in you know, this uh, uh, online event is how can this be sustained? How can it be mainstreamed within institutions? Uh, how can we have something which is not just a project, but something that is transformative of, of institutions? And how can institutional leaders uh, support this kind of shift? How can governments also do something. So these are really the two big questions that we're going to, to address um, over these different uh, set of seminars. This first one is with institution leaders, and we really have a pleasure to have a, a fantastic panel for that. And we'll have the two next ones will be more around what governments are doing and how they can actually uh, support that. So let me start by introducing our panel, uh, which Actually, we have uh, uh, two of the institutions participating in our project, Alto University from Finland and uh, McGill University, uh, Canada. But actually, Singapore, I always like to visit each time I go. So they are kind of a honorary member in some ways, even so they don't participate yet uh, in the project. So we have with us today uh, Elina Kekonen, who is a director of Alto Note an interdisciplinary program at Alto University, and we're going to learn more about it. We have Bernard Tan of University of Singapore, and who is a senior vice provost for undergraduate education. Uh, and 
the University of Singapore really, uh, National University of Singapore has a, a very a strong program, you know, focusing on critical thinking skills, creativity, and, and on teaching and learning. And so that's a very interesting one. And finally, we'll have Laura Weiner, also representing the institutional voice, who is a director of teaching and learning services at McGill University uh, in Canada. Last but not least, we'll have the, uh, an introduction and some comments by Tia Lukola, who is the head of the Center for Educational Research and Innovation at the OECD and the uh, head of uh, the Innovation and Measuring Progress Division at the Directorate for Education and, and Skills at the OECD and has a tremendous experience on higher education. And so she will actually lead us into the discussion. For that, all your questions are very welcome. What we're going to do, we're going to go first into a set of presentations where we can actually already take some of your questions. So if you have any notably clarification questions will be taken immediately if, if it is the case. Uh, but otherwise, we'll just group the questions and have a second round of interactive discussion based on your questions uh, uh, in the second. So post all of them in the chat uh, and we will do our best to, to, to address them. So without any further ado, I will now uh, give the floor to Elena, uh, who will actually talk to us about what Alto University in Finland is doing to support the development of uh, 21st century skills and innovation skills. Edina, you have the floor. Yes, and now I also have the screen shared. Possibly also my voice is heard. I am extremely grateful for having this opportunity to join this session and to share a thought on this very important and interesting topic of fostering 21st century skills by our universities and by our governments. Uh, I'm also very grateful for, for visiting OECD in Paris, even now in virtually. Uh, but the first question is, of course, as I come from Aalto, what is Aalto University doing uh, to foster 21st century skills? First of all, Aalto University exists. This might recall, uh, require a bit of elaboration, but Aalto University is really uh, just a bit more than 10 year, ago, uh, 10 year old university, which is a merger of three former universities, Helsinki University of Technologies, University of Art and Design Helsinki, and Helsinki School of Economics. Uh, these three schools, they were national top, and they were well established also international. And they might have continued as business as usual, and being top of their fields, but instead, the founders decided that we'll take a risk and we merge together in a new university. And drivers behind this were that the founders saw the need for enhancing and encouraging for innovation and for expertise for tackling complex global challenges. So this is from the beginning, this has been uh, 21st centuries have been well in the program of art. And from the beginning, there has been many initiatives of which I uh, here mention three, which are well in line and supporting 21st century skills. First of all, Alto Design Factory has been a totally new kind of uh, learning and product design hub for uh, researchers, industry, students, teachers, encouraging for innovation and experimentation by its inspirational spaces and also community of people from different fields. 
Auto Ventures program instead has been a forerunner of entrepreneurial competencies in auto education. And then Autonaut, from where I come from, uh, is a, a minor program on product development. But more importantly, it has been also a de development platform where to experiment new kinds of teaching methods and is with a special focus uh, on multidisciplinary co-teaching in multidisciplinary courses. Uh, these three and the other initiatives uh, have achieved a lot. And now we have also quite bold new strategy titled as Shaping a Sustainable Future with very ambitious goal that every ALTA graduate should be able to contribute to shaping a sustainable future. This means that our graduates should be able to identify, analyze, tackle wicked problems. And the students and staff should have firm understanding of the connections between sustainability and their own field. More over. Alto has chosen three uh, approaches how to uh, how to get to the goal we have set to ourselves. We have cross, uh, three cross-cutting themes which, should, which are crossing all our activities. We should do that. And I'm talking now about education part. So solutions for sustainability, radical creativity and entrepreneurial mindset. I have highlighted here those words which are totally uh, in line or identical with 21st century skills. Multidisciplinary setting means certainly collaboration and con communication, tackling complex challenges or redefining problems and solving them, creativity and opportunity identification, which might also reflect to innovation. So these are kind of um, pillars on which we built the competencies, which we aim at getting to our teaching. And then we come to question on what kind of teaching supports development uh, of 21st century skills or are in line with our uh, cross-cutting approaches. We must say that skills for tackling wicked problems or complex problems or uh, ill-defined challenges, however you want to call them, are best gained in multidisciplinary settings by working on open-ended challenges. They are not thought by lecturing or reading books only. And here we come to one pain point in teaching 21st century skills. As they call, this kind of teaching calls for extra resources. It calls more teaching stuff per study credit. And also it calls resources as more experience for teachers. And I have chosen this picture here. It visualizes, in my opinion, very well the challenges or extra resource requirements related to, uh, to this kind of teaching. You see this beautiful device these guys have built. It is evident that the specification has not been that built this kind of uh, this kind of device. There has been an open request that we need something to which can do something like this. And this team has walked through a very unpredictable path to this beautiful device. 
and this unpredictability of the path calls for teaching staff extra resources to support in unpredictable points of this path. And also experience for teachers. Experience also in that sense that they can ask help when they don't know anymore what will uh, what should these uh, guys be doing the next. So multidisciplinary co collaboration between the teachers. And how then to help teaching shift further towards this direction. One tool Aalto has established that we have a, an Aalto co-educator team to facilitate this, uh, transform uh, this shift towards this kind of improving uh, or increasing amount of this kind of teaching in Aalto. And we facilitate teaching development at all the levels from curriculum development to find meaningful connections between these themes and the original topic into which these themes should be in the integrated. By pedagogical courses uh, specifically focused into sustainability and complex open problem solving courses teaching. And then course development which is major share of our workload, is really hands-on work with the teaching teams or teachers of courses to find how to have these wanted elements at the courses in a relevant and meaningful way. And then we participate also development of incentives to, together with other parties. And I want to mention a bit more on this co-planning and co-teaching for integrating these themes, because this is the front end where the students also meet these competencies. They come to the students uh, when they are implemented in the courses. So the main ingredients in this kind of co-development, they come from the original course and its learning, in, uh, learning objectives. All what we are bringing in the course, they should only support, give a bit of uh, spice to, towards some direction, give uh, additionally, uh, additional skill or competence by changing the teaching method, uh, perhaps integrating a new teaching session, adjustment of some task, or just facilitation of the work co-planning and co-teaching of a teaching team. So these kind of activities might come to the question or have been, uh, these are our working, uh, working hypotheses. These are, according to our present experience, the ways to work. And so this is to help and to resource this shift towards better support, 21st century skills. Uh, and resources are needed in teaching for other things. And these uh, resource requirements come from uh, government. We have to uh, increase student intake, grad uh, make the graduation times shorter and provide life-wide learning uh, offering, life-wide learning courses. And these requirements set by government, they are supported with quite strong incentives, which are not necessarily pushing to the same direction as uh, the 21st century skills uh, would perhaps uh, need. Uh, education funding criteria over 80% number of degrees uh, with the emphasis on in time accomplished uh, degrees and 
credits for non-degree students. That's a major share. And then the rest student feedback employment one year after graduation and career follow up with one question on uh, 21st century skills directly. Uh, they count less than 20%. So will these incentives um, encourage putting resources to something which provides uh, credits and decrease efficiently and uh, or that they go into the deep skills that is something we might want to ask uh, or discuss during our coming discussion. Uh, so do they push towards the teaching methods calling for resources as mentioned in the or shown in upper picture or more efficient lecture exam way of working as seen in lower picture. Uh, in summary, uh, 21st century skills, the development calls for resource intensive teaching methods, which can be supported by co-planning and co-teaching and integrating these skills in existing courses. The resource requirements may be contradicting with the incentives set by governments. And I'm certainly looking forward to hear your comments, questions, and our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Edina. We have a lot of great food for thought already, and we have a very rich discussion. I just wanted to follow up on one question that was asked to you uh, by Rosie and about the role of students in uh, the you know, as partners in, in, in the multidisciplinary co-teaching approach that you have described, you know, as possible co-educators. So is it something that you have considered at Alto to uh, uh, include yes. students? Students have been very active participants, even in developing this uh, uh, during the strategic process. Students were participating and filling in uh, what do they see uh, as important topics for the new strategy, but also in many programs, uh, and we want to encourage this as much as possible to include students into the planning process of programs and possibly even courses. In our program, students have always been uh, active members. Thank you very much. So. Now let's move to Singapore and the National University of Singapore with uh, Bernard Tan. So Bernard, you have the floor or the screen, both actually. You're muted still, but we can see your screen. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well and we can see the screen. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you to the OECD organizers for inviting me to uh, share this presentation uh, talking about uh, education reforms at NUS. Now, we have been um, undertaking such education reforms over the last two or three years. And in fact, a lot of this work is done in the last two years. Um, as we all know, uh, we were all very badly affected by COVID during the last two years. And when COVID struck us, um, you know, as a management team in the university, we realized that uh, we could not travel. There are many things we plan to do uh, we could not do. Uh, then what can we do? And we decided that, okay, uh, we will not waste a pandemic. We will do education reforms at the university. So what do I mean by education reforms? Um, when we conducted our, uh, okay, when we conducted our education reforms, um, we want to prepare our students well for the future. And this is a chart that I believe uh, 
many of us have seen already, right? Um, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that if you look at the time frame for each successive industry revolution, uh, it gets shorter and shorter, right? And with can, can every... I, yes. Can, can I interrupt you one second? If you could yes the presentation more, that would be great so that we can see better your slide. Ah, okay. Is this better? Yes, that's perfect. Thank, thank you. you so thank you. Okay. So this is a slide that many of you have seen. Um, I like to draw your attention to the time frame below. You know, every successive industry revolutions happen faster and faster, and each revolution is more uh, pervasive uh, and more disruptive than the previous one, right? So if we think about the graduates who will come into my university today, uh, they will be working way into the 2060s and 2070s. And this simply means that they will see the full-blown Industry 4.0, or they may even see a glimpse of Industry 5.0, right? So what we can be very sure about their working environment is that um, they will be working in a very fluid, very disruptive environments where existing jobs will disappear. Many of them will be doing jobs that don't exist today. Industry boundaries, uh, you know, will become fluid, industries will merge and sometimes uh, split. So many things that will happen. And one thing that we are very sure about is that the students will be disrupted in their work and in their careers uh, multiple times throughout their working life, right? Now, when the disruption come, I notice that I don't say if the disruption comes, right? Because it will come. So when the disruptions come, uh, we do not want our students to succumb and then become underemployed or unemployed. We want our students to be so adaptable that they can reinvent themselves and they can prevail and uh, go on to do better jobs that might emerge when all these disruptions come, right? And given this motivation, we then start looking internally at our entire education system and think about what needs to be fixed. Now, here are the issues that uh, we are confronted with. Uh, first of all, we used to have a system that forces many students down the single disciplinary route. Uh, this is not good in a fourth industrial revolution workplace. Uh, we used to have a system that sometimes exposes students to more than one disciplines um, without helping them to see the connections between the disciplines. In other words, we focus on multidisciplinarity rather than interdisciplinarity. And this is not good uh, in a fourth industrial revolution workplace. We used to have a system that offers students very little choice when it comes to um, what kinds of majors you can do together with what other kinds of minor, second major specializations. Uh, this is not good, again, in a fourth industrial revolution workplace. Now, we used to have a system where we focus on helping students to find the first job after graduation, right? And we wish them luck for the rest of their careers. Uh, this is not good because uh, years after graduation, they can be disrupted in their work and we need to provide a means to have a means to support them throughout their entire working career, right? Um, yeah, and we used to have a system that tells them that uh, four years is all it takes for you to acquire a university education, you are good for a lifetime, um, but in future it cannot be like that, right? We need to allow all our graduates to have the opportunity to come back to the university to upskill and reskill as and when they need, as and when they are disrupted in their jobs and their careers so that they can learn new skills uh, they can prevail, they can pivot to new jobs that might emerge and do better in life, right? So with this in mind, uh, we start to undertake concrete initiatives to revamp our ed uh, university education curriculum. Um, here are the five pieces that uh, I will be sharing with you today because um, here are the pieces where we have gone far enough uh, for me to have the details to share with you. There are another three or four more pieces that are ongoing that I do not have enough details to share with you today. So the first piece is on uh, general education. Now we decided that um, in the fourth industrial revolution world, 
there are some fundamental skill sets uh, or qualities uh, that we want all our graduates to have irrespective of their major, their discipline. Um, therefore, we created all these six pillars and we expose all our graduates to these six pillars, right? Um, now, notice that for many years, uh, when we seek industry feedback about uh, what they hope to see in our graduates, right? They have always been telling us that um, they want our graduates to be more globally aware, uh, able to function in multicultural teams. They want our graduates to be more articulate in expressing their ideas, you know, succinctly, you know, and organizing their ideas. Therefore, under general education, you see that we have a pillar on cultures and connections to deal with the global awareness part. You see that we have a pillar on critique and expression to deal with the thinking and the articulation of ideas, right? Um, and we are also very acutely aware that uh, in a fourth industrial revolution world, every industry is going to be highly technology centric, highly data driven. Therefore, it is unacceptable to us that anybody should graduate from the university with zero knowledge on data literacy or zero knowledge on digital literacy. Right? Uh, and you can see that because of this, uh, we have a data literacy and a digital literacy pillar in the general education. Right? Um, of course, we have uh, Singapore studies, and this is uh, pretty much like doing American history in US universities. This is mandated by the Ministry of Education. And over and above that, um, we want our students to uh, have a heart for the community. So we have a pillar called communities and engagement where they will have to go out and carry out community projects for the benefit of those uh, more needy people in the community. So that is the general education framework that we want all our majors to expose themselves to. Right? Now I move on to the second piece of um, education reforms that we have. Um, the second piece has to do with the creation of CHS or the College of Humanities and Sciences. In other words, we decide to merge the curriculum for our Faculty of Science and our Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Now, why do we choose this faculty? Um, because we look at the employment statistics and discover that our science graduates and our arts and humanities graduates uh, go into a few similar industries, uh, uh, public service, education, healthcare, insurance and finance, for example. So they are not so different after all. And also um, we have received consistent industry feedback that we have to make our science students more rounded as in better with words uh, and our arts and humanities students more rounded as in better with numbers, right? So we decided to create a common curriculum for all our science students to give them broader exposure, a common, uh, this same curriculum for our arts and humanities students to give them a broader exposure. And also you will see shortly in the next slide, now, um, you know, in the common curriculum for science students and arts and social science students, there will be a good number of interdisciplinary modules where we expose them to a range of disciplines and show them how to solve problems by considering multiple disciplinary perspectives and making connections across disciplines, right? Um, in doing so, uh, of course, um, we will have to reduce the size of the major to accommodate the common curriculum. And I will share with you later why we are not concerned about uh, redu reducing the size of the major, right? Um, and over and above that, um, all science students and all arts and students, social sciences students will have unrestricted elective space, enough space for them to pursue a second major, um, one or two minor, one or two specialization that I will show you shortly afterwards. Okay, so this is a second piece of curricular reform. Now, the third piece of curriculum reform that we carry out has to do with the merger of the engineering curriculum with the design curriculum. Right. Um, you know, in the past, we used to train engineers and to train the designers, the architects separately. Um, and the industry is telling us that this is a, not a, an optimal way of training our students. You know, for example, if you think about how people work in the industry, right, the architects that design facilities 
the engineers that built these facilities and the uh, facilities management professionals who maintain these facilities, they work in interdisciplinary practice in the industry, but we train them separately in the industry. And many engineers who build products for people to use uh, and the designers, the industrial designers who make these products usable, they are trained separately, but they work together, right? So in order to move closer to what the industry is, uh, what is happening in the industry right now, uh, we decided that we need to merge the engineering and the design curriculum. And again, in merging these two curriculum, we created um, some common requirements for all engineering and all design students. Uh, and all these things will, uh, will expose them to a wider range of disciplines as well as providing them with exposure to interdisciplinary modules. I will be showing you some details later on. And, and again, when we do this, the consequence is that we have to reduce the size of the major somewhat. And I will share with you shortly why uh, this is not a concern. How do we overcome this constraint, right? Uh, likewise, all engineering students and all design students will have enough unrestricted elective spaces for them to pursue a second major, one or two minor, one or two uh, specialization, right? Now let's take a look at what the uh, common curriculum for science students and arts and social sciences students look like. Um, if you look at this uh, chart here, notice that there are a lot of these skill sets uh, that are important in the fourth industrial revolution world, right? Artificial intelligence, design thinking, data literacy, digital literacy. And also many of these modules are interdisciplinary in nature including integrated humanities, integrated social sciences, integrated Asian studies, the interdisciplinary modules, the scientific inquiry modules. So we are deliberately uh, cultivating in them a broader perspective uh, and also uh, equipping them with the kinds of skill sets that we think they will need um, when they work in the fourth industrial revolution world, right? Um, and when we implemented all these modules, in fact, I personally viewed the lectures for all these modules uh, to make sure that these are truly interdisciplinary in nature, right? That, they, that the colleagues uh, don't give me something on paper to approve and do something else on the ground. Now, let's take a look at the common curriculum for the engineering and the design students. Um, the yellow boxes are the... Uh, our general education modules that I talk about shortly. Um, notice that some of the other modules, uh, maker spaces, sustainable futures, project management, integrated projects, these are all interdisciplinary modules uh, linking design materials to engineering materials. And we are trying to cultivate our students in the way that when they go out to work, they will be able to easily function in uh, interdisciplinary team consisting of all kinds of engineers, all kinds of uh, designers, right? Now, with this curricular um, reform in place, um, what um, these are examples of options uh, that our students from science, students from arts and social sciences, students from engineering, and students from design can pursue, right? Um, if you are a diehard fan of a certain discipline, like for example, physics, for example, economics, for example, uh, civil engineering, right? What you can do is to follow path number two on the left, right? Um, you use your unrestricted elective space to do more of your major if you are really passionate about the subject and you can go on to become a deep specialist in that area if you so wish, right? But if you want to broaden your educational experience, um, notice that you, uh, you can use the unrestricted elective space to do a second major, and we don't even restrict, right? So you can be a physics major uh, doing a second major in economics. Um, you can do you you can be a project and facilities major doing a second major or a minor in civil engineering, mechanical engineering, or electrical engineering. So there are many permutations um, open to students. And we leave students to choose based on their inclination, their interests, and their passion, right? Um, and of course, the unrestricted elective spaces can be used to do anything that is of interest to you. 
a more major module, second major, minor, or even specialization, right? Now, what happens if a student chooses a path number two on the left, uh, be a deep specialist, right? And later on um, in their life, later on in their careers, these students want to need to find that, find that they have to broaden their knowledge and the skills in order to function well in their job, right? Uh, we have a scheme whereby all our alumni are automatically allowed to come back into the university uh, in the course of their careers uh, to pursue, to take more courses. And these are very heavily government subsidized courses, right? Um, and if you chalk up a specialization, we can certify you for that. You chalk up a major, a second minor, we can certify you for that. So if you, if you pursue that during your undergraduate education and you need breath later on in life, uh, no worries, come back to us and do a second major, a minor, right? Likewise, if you pursue breath during your undergraduate education and later on in life, you find that you have to deepen, uh, uh, no worries, come back to us and do specialization. We will credential you for this. Right? So we have a, a system, education system that what I call uh, no date ends uh, and it supports our graduates over their entire lifetime. Now, earlier on, I mentioned that in the process of doing all this, uh, we have had to reduce the size of our majors from about 20, 20 plus modules down to like 15 modules. Um, are we concerned about the, the reduction? In fact, we are not. Because um, based on the industry feedback, it's clear that 15 modules can make our students good enough to start working as a professional, right? If they need to acquire more, more knowledge uh, from more modules in the future, they can always come back uh, as a continuing education system. And we already have a way of uh, credentialing them for doing this. You know, so by seeing education as not just pre-employment training, uh, but pre-employment training, but continuing education and training, in fact, we free up many constraints of a typical university system, right? Okay. Now I move on to um, the fourth piece of initiative that we have. Um, you know, we, until not too long ago, um, our law students uh, uh, learn nothing but uh, law courses, uh, law modules, law courses, right? They, they take nothing but law modules, right? Um, but as you can see from this chart uh, published by the Boston Consulting Group, uh, increasingly lawyers are having to work with paralegals uh, and increasingly, lawyers are going to have to work with technology, including AI. I mean, the way they search for information, put things together is going to be very different, right? And many lawyers these days uh, don't spend their entire careers in the law firms. After a while, they go out to businesses to become uh, legal counsels and all that, and what have you not. Uh, therefore, it's extremely important for us to uh, broaden our law education, right? And in this regard, our law school actually trim. Uh, 25% of its curriculum, one out of the four years, and we free up one out of the four years of curriculum space for our students to do other things. Um, and by doing so, uh, we can admit some students from various STEM disciplines um, who have finished their first year into a law school and finished, and they can do their law degrees in the next three years, right? Um, we offer law students uh, combination uh, possibilities. You can do law plus public policy, law plus computing, law plus accountancy, law plus business, law plus economics, etc. Right? Um, we allow law students to minor in all the relevant uh, business and computing subjects. Um, we create a graduate law program to allow people with work experience to come in and do our law degrees. And of course, we provide certification programs for the lawyers who have graduated in the past and who do not have this kind of a broad exposure, but who suddenly find that the law industry, legal industry is changing and they need to have a greater exposure. So all these are the possibilities that we have created for existing students as well as our previous law graduates. Now I go into my final piece of curriculum revamp. And this is, has to do with our healthcare professional education, meaning um, our medical students uh, dentistry students, nursing students, and pharmacy students. And again, um, in the past, they learn nothing other than their major, right? Um, but we, you know, it, like, like many big cities, Singapore is confronted with an aging population. 
um, we are going to be having more and more people with chronic conditions and mobility challenges, right? And we cannot sustain a healthcare system whereby we wait for people to become sick. They come into the healthcare system and we try to fix our problem and hopefully they are well enough to go back out again. Um, moving forward, it is important that uh, we need to emphasize preventive over remedial healthcare. You know, helping people not to fall sick uh, as far as possible, right? Um, and we need to facilitate aging in place, uh, meaning that um, when people are sick, we can use technology, we can send out medical teams to the community to deliver services to them. Not everybody needs to come into the healthcare system. And this has to use, uh, this means that we have to use technology pervasively. Right? So um, in training our healthcare professionals, we are going to declutter their curriculum and make them do five of these pillars, uh, what we call essential pillars. Uh, we are going to tell, teach them social de and behavioral determinants of health, how to help people not to become sick. Um, and when they go out into the communities to care for people, uh, they, they cannot hide behind the bureaucracy and the system of a hospital. So they need to know how to work in uh, interdisciplinary teams, uh, inter interprofessional teams. Uh, they need to know what are the legal issues confronting all these medical, including patient personalities, uh, privacy, data privacy, and all that. Right? And of course, they need to be comfortable working with technology and data. So all our medical uh, dental, nursing, and pharmacy graduates need to have some level of data literacy and digital literacy, right? And this is the, the new curriculum that we are putting in place, right? Now, to conclude, um, I just want to let you know that as I speak, um, our business school is relooking at its uh, three majors. The computing school is relooking at its four majors. And some of you would have heard that we are combining our Yale NUS Liberal Arts College with our university scholars program to create a new college that will introduce even more educational innovations in the years ahead. Uh, these things are work in progress. Um, one year down the road, I may have some details that I can share with you, but uh, not now, right? And I want to say that what I just shared with you is our curriculum strategy, meaning um, what we teach and what the students learn. Uh, we also have a pedagogy strategy, how we teach, how the students learn that I can probably share with you at some other point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vena. That was a very rich presentation, which has actually triggered a lot of questions in the chat. We're not going to go through them right now. I just have one quick clarification question for you, or you know, hopefully for everyone. You've mentioned as part of the curriculum two different aspects. One you've called integrated courses, and the other one were the interdisciplinary ones. What is the difference? Very quick answer. Um, no, there are there are actually different kinds of uh, uh, education models. I mean, all of us are familiar with the uh, um, disciplinary education, right? Um, beyond disciplinary education, there's multidisciplinary education, meaning that we expose students to more than one discipline, like you major in physics, you minor in econs, right? Um, then beyond multidisciplinary education, there's interdisciplinary education, where we expose students to different disciplines and tell them how the disciplines relate to one another. For example, we will give them examples about uh, inter, about wicked problems, interdisciplinary problems, and show them that if you create solutions based on one or two disciplines without considering all the others, uh, you can very often create a solution that comes with other problems, right? It is only when you make connections among all the disciplines and consider the perspective of multiple disciplines when you create solutions, then the solutions will be optimal and less likely to be problematic in the future. So we expose students to many of these problems. That is interdisciplinary. Right? Now, beyond interdisciplinary education, in fact, there's still transdisciplinary education, which means no disciplinary boundaries. Uh, you look at problems and read up from any discipline that it takes for you to understand the problems. When you want to create solutions, you can draw from the knowledge of any discipline, no boundaries, and put these ideas together, right? So at NUS, uh, when we create that new college that we are in the process of doing, uh, we will introduce some elements of transdisciplinary education into it, uh, learn from the experience, and then after that, scale up to the rest of the university. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. So now let's move to um, Laura, Laura Weiner, Maggie University. Laura, you have the floor. You see you the... See the slide and we can okay. do it. Okay, so thank you very much. I want to um, echo the other participants um, in thanking OECD for organizing. Uh, this this session, which has already um, been extremely interesting for me to, to hear the other presenters um, and for inviting me. Um, and I, I did see something in the in the chat about we have Finland and, and Singapore who are sandwiched between superpowers. And I think Canada kind of falls in there um, as well as uh, we've been described as a mouse living next to an elephant. Um, so there may be something in that in that. Uh, questioning that that happens. So I've um, taken a somewhat different approach uh, and we'll be answering um, the questions that were, were posed to us, reflecting uh, to, to a large extent what McGill's uh, context is and how we are approaching it. So um, the first uh, point that I wanted to address was how does McGill support students? in fostering 21st century skills. So we have um, three major initiatives that are explicitly targeting students. Um, one is the McGill commitment. Um, and I will be um, making the slides available afterwards. Uh, I believe they'll be posted. And there are links to all of the, these projects um, on the McGill website so that you can find out much more information. Um, so the McGill commitment started actually in 2013. And it was a commitment that we made to our students. Uh, for our undergraduate students, it was providing meaningful exposure to research. Uh, research is understanding research, being a critical consumer um, and not only a contributor to research, is considered uh, a very important skill of the future. And it's something that we felt as McGill as a research intensive university, that we were in a, in a good position to offer that, um, that experience to our students. Um, and this is research, whether it's uh, in, in wet labs or scholarship in, in arts and humanities and social sciences. Um, and the McGill commitment for graduate students was really about um, ensuring or pr providing excellence in that in the supervisory relationship. We know that for graduate students who are doing research based degrees, the relationship with the supervisor and what one learns and how um, that relationship unfolds is really a key aspect to the to the experience. So we committed to really um, supporting instructors, uh, professors in becoming better supervisors. And we have a lot of programs that, uh, that target that and, and support graduate students in that way. Um, we are very focused at McGill on being uh, an international university um, and our international, uh, we, we have a fairly, high uh, percentage of our undergraduate students who are international. It's currently at about 25%, and we're committed to maintaining that. Uh, masters and doctoral is higher, it's 35%. We're continue, uh, we'd like to actually uh, increase that, and we've been, been working on that. Um, so it's, and that's about the, context at McGill that we want our students to be able to learn in. So if they're learning, if their peers are international, this gives them a diversity of experiences um, and opportunities that if you have a more homogeneous group, it, it's harder to, um, to create those opportunities for really questioning um, and understanding uh, diverse perspectives. Uh, we supported pre-pandemic, uh, we supported a lot of student mobility activities, um, and we're looking at how we're going to continue that um, and perhaps uh, make more diverse opportunities in the post-pandemic context um, that we hope that we will be approaching soon. Um, the next two uh, programs that I've mentioned, the Skills 21 and Skill Sets, 
Our programs that are designed, Skills 21 uh, is for undergraduate students, Skill Sets is for graduate students. As you can see from the name, Skills 21 was Skills for the 21st Century. Uh, these programs are run out of the center that I direct, the Teaching and Learning Services, and it's run out of the learning. We have a, a, a section devoted uh, to student learning and development. And they, uh, both of these programs are workshop-based skills development uh, programs. Skills 21 was started in 2017. Skill sets is 2009. Um, focusing again on the transition to work, what are the skills that students need, both while they are studying, but more importantly to transition once they've completed their, their studies um, so that they can be, well equipped to handle the uh, ever changing nature of the the workplace that they are going to find themselves in. Um, the second thing I wanted to address was, whoops, sorry about that. How do we support teachers? Um, so teaching and learning services supports many facets of teaching at McGill um, from pre-planning stages of course development to assessment to the instructional strategies that are used in the, in the classroom. We also work on creating the environments that um, teacher instructors will be teaching in. That's the physical classroom environment, the physical teaching lab environment, and the virtual environment in the digital world that uh, certainly in the past two years has become essential to our work. Um, we do this in, in, at, in two ways. One is the university-wide, uh, where we try and address needs across the university. Um, and then we also have uh, collaborative projects with three faculties, engineering, management, and science, where we have embedded staff who are working very closely uh, with instructors from those uh, faculties as well as the leader academic leadership within them to really customize this vision and customize the support that's needed. Um, to provide support uh, for instructors, just to give you an idea, we have um, about 2200 full time academic staff who are all involved in teaching uh, for about 40,000 students. So um, there's a lot of teaching that goes on by um, a lot of people. Um, so we've created a teaching and learning knowledge base, which is accessible um, by the web. Um, and it provides really detailed information on the what, the why, and the how of course planning, course implementation, course evaluation, teaching and learning technologies, provides teaching checklists and provides um, information on how to get additional support. And we felt that the what, the why and the how are really key. You have to know what it is that you're talking about, why it is a good idea to do it. And then finally get in, getting into the nuts and the bolts of, of how do I really implement this? We like to provoke, um, promote and support reflection and feedback from students. So we have a university-wide uh, university system of course evaluations, which uh, in all courses are evaluated every term. And we have a, a whole series of tools and supports for instructors to take this feedback and use it in meaningful ways to support their teaching. Finally, the institutional policies uh, and regulations create the framework um, within which teaching and, and learning happen. And there, um, there's a major initiative on right now to do a, a complete overhaul of our policy on assessment of student learning. And we are uh, introducing a principles-based approach, which allows for more diverse and inclusive assessment methods. Um, and we're very excited that this will really help provide the framework that will support instructors in taking more creative approaches, um, 
introducing more experiential learning. We have assessed guidelines for assessment of experiential learning, having people be able to have more authentic assessments, which will really help in assessing are the students acquiring these new skills that we want them to. Um, in terms of institutional initiatives, I just wanna to mention two. Uh, we have uh, an equity office which is working systematic, systemically to address a range of equity issues um, and supporting McGill in becoming an institution that is active in its opposition to racism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination will help McGill become an institution of and for the 21st century. Um, embracing the benefits of diversity is needed not only because it's the right thing to do, but to ensure that McGill students develop the necessary skills to work in increasingly diverse contexts and environments. Uh, the second initiative that I want to mention is a working group that was set up by the Office of the Provost on new models of academic, pro uh, new models of academic program delivery. And this group is tasked with recommending strategies and directions for the evolution of academic program delivery, including broad pedagogical strategies. And this is all with a view to, to adapting to the new, the new world. Our, much of our delivery models um, have been the same for many, many years. And it's really putting into question some of the fundamental building blocks that we've um, that we've been operating with. Uh, and the first report of this is due in fall 2022. It's a group teaching and learning. I'm, I'm involved in this as the director of teaching and learning services. There are other instructors involved and there are students as well. Um, finally, I want to talk about the um, public policies, the question around public policies and how could they support our internal work. Um, and the main thing I wanted to focus on, and this may seem very minor, but for us, it's really, um, really impedes our, our liberties in many ways, that we, we have government definitions of terms, what's a course credit, what are levels, um, like masters, doctoral certificates, um, and how tuition is charged and, and um, calculated based on residency, based on within the program, outside of the program, um, that are really quite constraining at the moment. And we need more flexibility from our Ministry of Higher Education to allow for flexibility in, in defining these terms and in how they implement these terms. Um, they have con the question of what is a university credit? Um, it says, you know, 135 hours of work. It's not at all clear. We have uh, constraints for contact time. Well, what is contact time? Is contact time if I'm sitting face-to-face -face in the classroom? Is contact time if I'm synchronous online? Um, all of these things are, are really um, impeding us. Um, and there are, there are big questions about what the role of e-learning will be in the future of the Quebec educational system. Uh, in Canada, education is a provincial jurisdiction, so we don't have the kind of national policies that my colleagues from Finland and Singapore have talked about. We are very much um, governed by the Quebec uh, framework. However, we look at our neighbors, you know, Ontario uh, is the largest province. It works in, it has a very different vision in many ways. So how do we navigate this and how do we get the flexibility that we need? Um, finally, I promised the links will all be in the presentation. Uh, I wanted to make sure that they, they're embedded as well if you click on the, the icons and the images in the presentation, but I wanted to make sure that uh, you would have easy access to these. So those will be, um, those will be made available uh, when, when, it's made, when the um, presentations are made avail available through OECD. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for this really great presentation. I was actually very glad that you made the connection with uh, internationalization and the international mobility of students and how actually this contributed to create the, the context as this has really been one of 
you know, the big interest we've had at the OECD, you know, in the past uh, years on, on, on higher education. Um, and also, I think that you, all the things around the regulatory framework and all these things that constrain us really open a lot of, of discussion. Perhaps I have just one very quick clarification question, but we'll get back to that in the discussion. Uh, someone asked about how you, your assessment, you, you've, you've, uh, which instrument or tool you use for assessing some of these skills, if you can share that. Uh, the skills within the um, the student, the, the yes. skill 21 and skill sets? Yes. Um, they, it, it varies. There's, um, it, it varies from, there are experiential projects where people have to, to show almost a portfolio or um, really demonstrate, but all of those are non-credit activities. Mm. So they have much more freedom and flexibility. Uh, we don't have to grade them in that way. We operate a lot on providing feedback, formative feedback to students, but we're less concerned about the summative aspect of it. In terms of how we assess, that's what in the credit context, that's what we're working on right now of re, really revamping our approach to assessment of student learning. Um, so the, it is the student skills programs all receive a recognition on a co-curricular record that we have. So the students can say, yes, I did, I, I participated in these uh, activities and they have an outline for the activity and they can show what the all of them have intended learning outcomes that are articulated in them and they can they can speak to it themselves but it's it's more in a sense up for the student to demonstrate to be able to demonstrate their accomplishments rather than us grading them on it thank you thank you so much so i will ask now the panel to come back and uh, ask uh, Tia Lucola uh, to get us started with some comments and remarks and perhaps questions uh, to, to, to the panelists. So Tia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Stefan. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to, co to be the one uh, who gets to comment after these exciting case studies. Um, as I was listening to our speakers, I thought that this is actually really a great panel. Uh, we have three continents. Uh, we have flora in the winter, uh, Bernard, what looks like summer, and then uh, we have Elena in the outer space uh, and perhaps the nighttime. So um, uh, the diversity is already there. But while there is a huge geographical diversity, uh, what I found fascinating is that um, there are a lot of commonalities. Uh, it was great that all, all the speakers were focusing on a little bit different aspect of how they are trying to tackle this, uh, this issue, but uh, a lot of commonalities. And uh, if we didn't have so many questions already in the chat, I would have liked to challenge the speakers by asking uh, you to say something that you really disagree that your fellow panelists said. And I would think that you probably would have the difficulty saying, I would guess that many of you were listening to the colleagues and saying that, yes, we've uh, thought about that as well. We, have, uh, we are doing it as well, but I left it out of this presentation. So uh, uh, th I think this gives us uh, at OECD a great uh, kind of basis for our international work, uh, knowing that we have a lot of commonalities uh, in these issues. Um, so what, what would those be? Um, I, I like the way that Bernard uh, finished by saying that you now focused on what you teach, whereas you could do another presentation on how we teach it, um, where, and which then leads us to the support for the staff, for instance, uh, which was then uh, uh, referred to by Laura and uh, Elena. So what this demonstrates is that you do need a lot of different measures if you're really aiming at a cultural change. And that is what this sounds to me like is that what we're aiming at is really a cultural change. We have processes in place, we have uh, structures in place, but what we're aiming at is to have a kind of holistic uh, 
change in how we think of the role of uh, education um, and um, what kind of matters we indeed teach the students. And that should be then reflected in how we teach them. Um, talking about the culture, I've, I've often um, I've sp spoken about the institutional cultures in the past a lot. And I noticed in the, in the participants list that there are colleagues who have heard me talking about culture and how you need for the culture, you do need these formal processes that were discussed largely in, in the three uh, presentations, but you need the commitment as well. Uh, and the commitment doesn't necessarily come, uh, come only from the institutional strategies and policies and about the leadership deciding this is what we do, but it also comes from bottom-up approaches and commitment from the staff and teachers. Maybe uh, in the follow-up uh, conversation there could be those discussion how to foster the commitment and uh, find the right balance of bottom uh, up, uh, top down. Um, and in that context, uh, it was interesting that uh, uh, Laura did finish with something that will be discussed in, uh, I think, in a later stage in, over the, these two days, which is the framework conditions. Um, it was lovely to hear that institutions can do things. Uh, we can take the initiative, we can shape and reform our our, our education and how we deliver it, but then we do need to have the right collaboration with the policymakers as well, have the flexible frameworks. I think this came across in, in, different, uh, in different presentations that uh, at the national policies or system level policies need to reflect it. Uh, and I actually thought of this international aspect, Stefan. We have a discussed a lot in, in the international collaboration uh, defining frameworks. We want the international framework so that our, our graduates can move around in the global work market. And that actually often leads to um, frameworks that actually stop the innovation. So uh, for it will be interesting as the innovation continues and the decrees look uh, more and more different. And we are competence-based. We're not, we shouldn't be talking about uh, hours, for instance, as uh, Laura was uh, saying. Um, in the future, how do we then ensure the transparency of these qualifications that we award so that the employers uh, uh, understand them and this was something that came across in the in the chat, I think, as well, that what do the employers think about our reforms? So a lot of questions, but uh, Stefan, perhaps Indeed. you continue with the questions? Yes, and thank you. you very much. Thank you, Jan. I will just follow up on, on actually that question because it captures very well a lot of the different questions that we have uh, in the chat, you know? So, uh, and I would like you to invite all of you to take the you know question in, in, in the way that, that we want, but I would say that, um, one question is around the, this idea of personalization, you know, and how we actually need to have something which is more um, student-centric and personalized, and that's something that came across uh, your different presentations. Uh, and so that's one aspect of it, um, and which relates to what Tia was just saying in terms of, you know, how can we actually do that and at the same time have uh, degree that we are going to be recognized, etc. And the second, which is related, in my view, is and that came across a lot of questions in the chat is around uh, assessment versus common curricula. So, should we have the right assessments to actually try to measure to what extent these skills have been developed, uh, and is and not care so much about what the curriculum is, or should we actually pay a lot of attention to having common curriculum or some specifications of the curricula, as is certainly the case uh, at NUS and, and ALTO from what, what we've heard, you know, in terms of uh, that. So do you have a, what is your take on that? Who wants to start? Laura, go ahead. Um, 
I, I thank you very much. And I, I just had a couple of, of comments. First of all, um, just to refer quickly to Tia's uh, comment about the importance of, you know, matching top down with bottom up change management is something that we're very focused on in our new models of academic delivery working group we recognize that and we're trying to address that very early on of how do you get local champions and there's you know books and models on change management and i think it it's really important universities don't always um, consider that and be as intentional about that as as they should so i think it's a really important point I think your the the question about how do we balance um, you know standard common degrees with individualization the approach that we took at McGill was really in going beyond the curriculum and what I was saying about the co-curricular record our skills 21 and skill sets are not part of the curriculum although there are interestingly enough some some graduate programs that require their students to take certain of the workshops or of the modules within of the training programs, that's where the students can express their own um, their own interests and follow their own interests. And I think our attitude has been not everything has to be for credit. Um, it still is important that the university provide the context and the supports um, and the mechanisms by which the students can explore the areas that are of interest to them, but not everything has to be for credit. And I think if we try and and cram everything into the curriculum and the degree and it has to be on a transcript and it has to have a great, you know, we're, that that becomes a very, very challenging um, tension to meet. So I think we have to expand our vision and say student student learning at a university is not just about what they do for their major. It's about, we talk a lot about the university experience, the McGill experience, and it's something that we try to extend, extend and get students to see that it's also up to them to take the initiative in some cases and say, oh, this is something I'm interested in. I want to pursue it or give them the opportunities to explore. So I think for that, we have to go beyond the curriculum. Thank you. And this speaks also to one question we had initially on, you know, how do university programs complement the other ways of acquiring uh, the 21st century skills, you know, so I think, so Elena. Yeah, uh, I fully agree that it, it is extremely challenging to put, uh, or it may be challenging to put these in the curricula. And uh, I still think that uh, when something is uh, uh, considered as a, our strategy, we are committed to that. We kind of uh, we are obliged to put it into the route of all the students, and not only those ones who are interested. We have I'm running a minor program with which is elective and elective courses as well. So I see that this is one tool but it is something that attracts those ones who are really motivated. We have great uh, student organization in our, they have uh, launched, they have changed Finnish culture for uh, thinking entrepreneurially, but uh, they, they are still one uh, minor part. And if we want to have similar kind of skills for all, then these must be, somehow negotiated and this is where i agree fully that with laura that it is about change management and leadership and it is about the uh, persuasion uh, with these very autonomous programs schools departments but there we still need to find space somewhere in the path of the students Otherwise, they are really overwhelmed with all kinds of uh, elective activities. But this is my point. Thank you, Elena. So I have a question directed to Bernard, and we'll go to the question of the reception, because I believe that's a bit also what we're uh, uh, asking. So one question for you, Bernard, was uh, how did the industry you know, and the employers respond to, uh, to, to your model? And then I will have one for Laura and Elena, which is, you know, we, universities are a very diverse, fragmented um, 
society in some ways. We, we could see it, Bernard, with your presentation, a lot of different faculties, a lot of, and so what was the reception, you know, and, and so um, to actually go back to the question that Tia asked, you know, how do you get it really owned by uh, the people at, at the institutional level? So, but then after, um, yes, there, there are, I think there are um, a number of very good questions, uh, pretty much aligned with what uh, Stefan, you've just said, right, in the chat, right? Um, so let me attempt to provide some um, answers that will cover not just your questions, but these other questions in the chat as well, right? Now, industry consultation, uh, that is a very important part of our education reforms uh, in the sense that for every piece of education reforms that we do, um, we do engage the industry very extensively, particularly the big employers and the very forward-looking companies. Um, we don't choose the companies that are lagging behind because uh, these ones will vanish in the fourth industrial revolution world and we don't worry about them. Right? We pick the forward-looking companies and they give us many ideas and many thoughts. Uh, uh, in fact, after sharing with us a lot of things that you know, they think will happen in the future. And this is what you see in our curriculum, right? They worry for us. Uh, um, they tell us that uh, universities are known to be very slow moving animals. Uh, are you guys even capable of doing this, right? And therefore we decided to do all these things and prove all of them wrong. And many of them actually came on board um, to contribute their expertise, contribute adjunct professors, contribute resources to help us make this happen, which they think is important, right? So um, hearing from the employers is very important because as we all know, many professors are trained in our disciplines uh, and many of us are very passionate our, about our disciplines, but fearful of going far beyond that, right? Um, hearing from the major employers that these are the kinds of things that we need to be doing in the future, uh, in a sense, move many colleagues along with us. Uh, because these are the ones who are hiring our graduates and sustaining our jobs, uh, if, you, if you allow me to put it that way, right? And if this is what the customer wants, um, how can we not do it, right? So that helps us a lot. And having said that, I must tell you that um, when we start rolling out all these new interdisciplinary modules and all that, uh, we do choose the instructors very carefully. Um, there are some that are already on board and very easily um, with a little bit of training, they can come on board and do this. Uh, there are also those that um, won't be able to come along even if we pull their teeth, you know, and those are the ones that we don't touch. Uh, we, we, we choose the right type of colleagues, roll out these modules as a sample for all to see what can be accomplished in interdisciplinary modules so that over time, hopefully more and more colleagues are able and willing to move in this direction. Right. So this is the industry part. Um, the other comment that I want to make has to do with um, learning. Personal. Now, I have told many of my colleagues many times that education is more so about student learning than your teaching. Right? If your students learn nothing, then you have effectively taught nothing, even if you show up in class week after week. Right? So how do we facilitate um, personalized learning? Um, at one level, uh, we allow for choices, right? In my presentation, we say our students can uh, do major with all kinds of specialization, minors, second majors, and what have you not. No restrictions. They do what they are passionate about, right? And over and above that, um, in the last two years, we have also come to realize that when it comes to those one-way lectures, didactic lectures, uh, it's best that we use technology to deliver the contents in ways that a human being can do, right? Um, deliver the contents and students can view it as many times as they want, as they need, as and when they need, right? Um, and then we use our face-to-face in-person classes to deliver value-added education to students, problem-solving, discussions, debates, um, and you know what have you know, all kinds of creative things that we do, right? And we also learned that um, to facilitate personalized learning, it's always good to give them a lot of those uh, real life projects, experiential learning, where they actually work in groups to go out and solve real problems, much like what they would do when they go out to work. Um, and therefore for our higher level modules, the final university years, uh, most of our modules have no exams. They are all um, uh, authentic assessment based uh, modules. 
yeah, that's how we um, promote personalized learning. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Laura, Edina, do you want to say a word on, on the reception? A quick one, because we are reaching the yeah, end uh, of the time. If I could just make a couple yeah. very quick comments. I think what, what struck me of what Bernard just said was the tension between um, universities as a place for an education and universities as a place for job training. And that's a tension that surfaces all of the very, very often in our conversations. Our accredited programs, um, which are most of our professional programs, have accreditation requirements that come from outside the university. So that means, for instance, that having elective courses for students doesn't actually make it accessible to everybody because the students have so little free space in their programs. And we can't change that. But that was one of the reasons why we went to non-credit activities as a way to allow them. But that tension between education and training is one that has, um, we're, we're a university, we're not, a, even though we have professional schools within us, it's, it's that, that tension exists all the time. Um, and I, I think that one of the things that's been really exciting for us at, at teaching and learning centers, we say if it weren't for how awful it was, the pandemic's probably been the best thing to happen to higher education, certainly um, in my lifetime, in terms of uh, in the number of courses that now have final exam ha exams has dropped by 30%. Um, so instructors are looking at other ways of assessment because they realize that we did not have proctoring. If you do an online exam, it's an open book. You have to think about it differently. So why not think about um, uh, think about assessment differently? How do you you know the notion of recordings for the lecture and then when you get together because they're getting together for reduced time? All of these things have really been um, brought to the fore, and people have seen that what they used to say, oh, that can't be done, actually can be done. Um, so it's forcing a lot of very productive thinking. And what we want to do is build on that. Thank you. We have a paper on remote exams. And, and so for those who are interested, Edina? Perhaps uh, there is two minutes time, I guess. <laughs> so uh, I will just uh, say that, yes, it is, uh, it is persuasion work to move in, uh, move in the curriculum development, course development, and we need to have uh, this cultural change, but it can be drawn by examples. When we find a good colleague who has done this thing, then we, are, we have something to hold on that. This is, this is a, it is possible. You can have deep disciplinary knowledge and still have these 21st century competencies with your course integrated. And uh, there we need uh, these peer support examples and cultural change. They are kind of the changing from my course to our teaching and sharing what we have learned. Thank you. So I would just like to ask you each to have uh, not more than 20, 30 second answer to that, but basically, we are going now to have the next sessions on the role of governments. What would you want the governments to actually do to support you or what do you think they could do to support institutions such as yours to embrace this journal? And Tia, what can governments at our level do? You know, so that would be your question. But let's start with uh, Bernard, but not more than 20 seconds, Bernard. Okay, um, in Singapore, I'm grateful about the fact that the government has been very generous. I mean, we have this uh, scheme of allowing students to come back and top up their skills, right? And the government actually pays more than half the fees. Without their support, this would not have been possible. I think that is immensely important because we do not know what critical skills will crop up in the future. And until 10 years ago, we didn't even think that data or digital literacy would be so important, but now it's so important. 10 years down the road, something else could be very important. So this is... Uh, critical. And one, one other thing that I, should, I think I should say is um, somebody did ask me uh, um, that how do you know that doing all these curricular reforms, uh, you are definitely right. Of course, none of us can predict the future. Um, I may be, we may be right, we may be wrong. Right? 
But I told these people that, uh, look, when we do this, we may be right, we may be wrong. But I can tell you for sure that doing nothing is definitely wrong. So being maybe right and maybe wrong is better than being definitely wrong. And therefore, we have to do all this. Thank you. Thank you. Edina. Focus more on competencies and skills than credits. Laura. And decrease. I think for our government, um, it would be to recognize the diversity of the higher education needs and institutions and roles within the province. We have um, many different institutions that have very, very different missions, visions, mandates. Um, and, and I think that to allow more recognition of that diversity and allow that diversity to flourish would be, would be really helpful. Thank you, Tia. Well, on top of the things that have already been mentioned, uh, I'd say facilitate peer learning, whether it is at national level or international level, uh, provide the opportunities for uh, uh, universities, higher education institutions to share their experience so that we can disseminate good practices and learn from those, perhaps the mistakes that have been made, uh, uh, as Bernard said. Those happen along the way, of course, and we can learn from them. Thank you. So thank you so much to all of you for participating in the session and get us started in that discussion. We are actually trying to uh, stimulate this peer learning. And uh, the next session we'll have uh, in one hour from four to five is actually on some governmental initiatives. And so we invite you to join you and we'll have one tomorrow as well. Uh, so thank you so much to the panelists. We had a wonderful discussion, not enough time, which is always a sign of good discussions, uh, but we'll continue uh, in, in, in the next. And, and so thank you very much to, to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.